Welcome, I'm Ogan Garel. We're smiling here because our guest, Dr. Paul Kent. Paul, who is a classmate of mine, uh, recognizes, of course, the Harvard uh, fight song. Uh, we'll talk about that shortly. But again, welcome to I Harvard, I on Harvard, the world's only internet TV talk show about Harvardians and about the world affecting Harvardians. We have a great show ahead of us, and uh, just when we were hearing the bumper with the uh, music, we brought back good memories. And uh, Paul tells me, I'll introduce him formally, that he knows the words he was in the band and all that, so maybe we'll get into that as well. But first, uh, as you know, we have the weekly iHarvard update. We have four individuals, Yo-Yo Ma, Mark Zuckerberg, Bill O'Reilly, and Brooke Ellison to update you on. So Yo-Yo Ma, who um, was the college class of 1976, here he is with his cello, of course, he's very famous cellist, world famous, and a real ambassador of culture and music. And in fact, he's doing that with his Silk Road project, which uh, is celebrating its 10th anniversary next year. It started with an October 22nd uh, concert in Shanghai. And basically, uh, the Silk Road project that he has uh, really put forth uh, emphasizes tolerance and understanding of different cultural traditions. And to the extent that I, Harvard, and In Time TV in general is global, we've been seen on six continents. And one of our understated missions is really to bring together different cultures and and expose uh, ideas from different people from around the world and obviously Harvard is very representative of that and I Harvard is the the show for that and uh, Yo-Yo Ma sees quote connections between Asian music and classical music <coughs> Beethoven is a favorite of mine like the Sufi sect of Islam is trying to reach a moment of transcendence in his music and uh, as I mentioned and we can talk about music Beethoven's a fan of uh, I'm a fan of uh, Beethoven and uh, definitely have had experience of transcendence with his music. So that's Yo-Yo Ma doing great stuff out there, uh, ambassador of music, obviously ambassador of Harvard as well. Second topic is Mark Zuckerberg, actually a Harvard dropout in the footsteps of Bill Gates, but certainly uh, one of us. And um, his uh, company, Facebook, uh, head-to-head -head competition with MySpace plus all the controversies around the uh, precedence of intellectual property, etc. The interesting story in Business Week was that uh, Microsoft is attempting to buy a 5% stake in Facebook for as much as $500 million, which values Facebook at $10 billion. Eighteen months ago, Mark Zuckerberg was much derided. It was called the uh, uh, you know, really crazy for rejecting Yahoo's $1 billion offer. And in 18 months, it's now valued at $10 billion. And what's interesting about this is that uh, the pundits and the uh, business press are commenting there are two factors that have led to the increase in value for Facebook. One is that it's not just a social networking site, but really a platform to bring other people to other groups, other companies to put in plug in utilities to enhance the value for its members and that's a very powerful model sort of taking up on the Microsoft model of allowing other software to plug into their system and we'll see how that uh, turns out the other aspect of that is that Facebook is uh, considered uh, uh, even though it's smaller than MySpace quote a higher end demographic and it has not escaped our notice as hosts of iHarvard with a higher end demographic that uh, this may bode well for our show and for in time TV so keep an eye on Facebook and keep an eye on Harvard <laughs> sorry for the pun there Paul is laughing here so another Harvardian in the news Bill O'Reilly uh, it's a little bit strange for me a uh, newcomer to the media scene of sorts to be going head-to-head -head with Bill O'Reilly but actually I will not uh, comment on his recent controversy he had made some comments at Sylvia's uh, soul food restaurant about African Americans. I'm not going to comment on that. It's very controversial. Certainly, I'm not the last word. It's a very important topic, uh, uh, racial perceptions and all that. Uh, what I will comment on, and the reason why I'm not going to comment on, I don't know if that makes sense, <laughs> is that, quote, Bill O'Reilly was a little more stung by the play this story got, and he, quote, pledged to use all his power to fight any personal and smear attacks in the media no matter who they were by and who they were against. In fact, he vowed to seek out all such behavior and punish it himself. I'll come to your house, he warned. So here I am talking about Bill O'Reilly. I do not, I mean, maybe a great guy and, and certainly uh, 
lot to say. I'm not really that excited about him coming to my house and <laughs> uh, beating down on the door, etc. So I'm not actually going to comment and attempt any smear attack. What I will say is that I think uh, Bill, as a Harvard graduate, uh, certainly I don't want to attack you, but I think you have the answer, the right answer to everything. I think you know everything. I think that uh, it's just impossible to argue with you. And uh, that's what I think and that's what I know. But I will also say that everything I think and I know is not necessarily correct. So let's leave it at that. <laughs> Lastly, we have a report in the Boston Herald, uh, a very touching story uh, about a stem cell event, the Stem Cell Summit, which began on October 2nd, a two-day event bringing together academicians, venture capitalists, policymakers, politicians, etc., uh, about stem cells, uh, about 600 attendees. A prominent attendee was Brooke Ellison, graduate of Harvard College. There she is. She was the subject of a, one of Christopher Reeve's, his, Christopher Reeve's final project. And she herself, uh, she's been paralyzed since age 11, has lobbied President Bush to ease restrictions on stem cell research and uh, has really uh, made a name for herself as a Harvardian in that arena. And we will continue her quest, and maybe not so much in the political realm, but in our understanding of stem cell research and the implications with our distinguished guest today. Uh, that's the iHarvard Weekly Update, and we're going to start talking about stem cells and in particular about what are the whole topic of cord uh, blood and uh, all the aspects thereof uh, that are of interest to a general audience. Any audience that uh, uh, is contemplating having children, any of you have families and who have had children, in fact, just on a general level. It's a very fascinating topic. Uh, I've talked about it with Paul, uh, and uh, we're excited to share some of his insights and experience with you. Uh, Dr. Paul Kent is class of 86, and uh, I'm class of 86, uh, and we never crossed paths. And I was trying to figure that out, and you were on the track team. Track, uh, cross country, and band. Yeah. Uh, pretty and, much took up all my time. Right, and uh, <laughs> when he said band, that's why he was really smiling at the yeah. uh, bumper with the... I think that was us. That might have been you? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and uh, I was on crew, and I spent all my time at the boathouse, so... The land, land and water don't mix, I guess. Well, we'd run along the side and see if we could keep up with you. That was our, during our tra training runs. Right. <laughs> and so uh, I did a lot of racing, and maybe I was racing you. Yeah. Well, in any case, let me get to the, a little bit of the serious background. We'll talk about a little personal aspects, uh, because uh, his, his track career is actually quite fascinating. But uh, Dr. Kent Paul is assistant professor of pediatric hematology oncology at Rush University Medical Center. He's graduate of Harvard College in 86, went to medical school at the Mayo Clinic College of Medicine, did residency at the Mayo Clinic as well as the University of Chicago, did fellowship, came to Chicago at, at Children's Memorial Hospital, is a specialist in bone tumors, brain tumors, and thrombotic disease of children. We're going to be right back and talk about, Doctor, what should I do with my baby's poor blood? Serious topic, but a lot of interesting twists. Stay right there. Great. My little horse. She's a lion. Yes, she is. <laughs> you don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. When you adopt a child from foster care, just being there makes all the difference. Seven years ago. Think history is a little scary? Then log on to LOC.gov and see how much fun it can be. The Library of Congress at LOC.gov. Welcome back. I'm Ogan Garel, class of 86. Uh, we just went through the weekly Harvard Roundup, and we are starting our program with Dr. Paul Kent. Paul, also class of 86, 
he was busy uh, running away from the cruise shells. We were uh, <laughs> uh, racing. Uh, he was on land and we were on sea. Sounds like Paul Revere in <laughs> Boston and all that. But we're talking about, doctor, what should I do with my baby's cord blood? And uh, before we dive into that, I uh, just want to do on a little personal side, a fascinating career. Tell us a little bit about your career progression. Obviously, you're now assistant professor of pediatric hematology oncology. In particular, what in your experiences, for example, at Harvard or through your interesting career have gotten to you to this stage? I think uh, starting at Harvard, we hopefully were engendered and perhaps chosen for an idea of service. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we were privileged by every definition, I think. Uh, and so hopefully that makes you feel desire and uh, to do something where you'll make a contribution. So my original idea was uh, I went to Indonesia for several years as a teacher and I imagined myself being in the World Bank or uh, public health uh, type initiative, uh, infectious diseases, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. When I went to Mayo for med school and residency though, I found that I was drawn to the cancer patients. They, they, their families, their stories, um, their suffering, their joy, all of that. And so I, my, path, my life took a different path, although uh, someday I'd love to go back to Indonesia. I'd love to uh, do something along the lines of public health and uh, infectious diseases. Just as a side note, we were talking before, you were a teacher actually at Barack Obama's school. Yes. Or, <laughs> I mean, he went, Barack Obama also went to Harvard, so not right. that school, but his uh, elementary school. And there's been some controversy that yeah. it was a madrasa and... Right, which is ridiculous. It's called Jakarta International School, obviously in Jakarta, Indonesia. It's one of the finest schools in the world, not one of the finest schools in the country. And the reason we can, I can say that is they had the International Baccalaureate Program 20 years ago, uh, and the, the graduates went to the best finest universities in the world um, and had amazing scores. Uh, it was before that it was called the American School, Jakarta American School, and that's where Barack went, but it was amazingly so intense and was not in any way a religious school. <laughs> so where do they come up with these uh, things? I have no idea. Did it appear on it was a Muslim country, of course, and you know many of my friends are Muslim, but... I wonder what uh, Bill O'Reilly had to say about that. <laughs> we don't know, but in any <laughs> case... Definitely not. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> So you're now in the field of cord blood and stem cells, and that's a big area. So why don't you just tell us a little bit about the whole area of stem cells. I know there are obviously there's the embryonic stem cells, there's the cord blood and, and all that. Why don't you organize that for us? Well, I think you said it very well. That, that's the whole point. I think that people use the phrase uh, stem cells, and without an adjective before, you really are not um, entering the conversation correctly and mm -hmm. you're not really speaking uh, correctly. For an embryonic stem cell has the capacity to do anything, including make a human being, make tissues, make new organs, regenerate tissues, uh, which is why it's so powerful, why it's so exciting, and why it's so controversial. Mm -hmm. Because but, it's from embryos. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Whereas there are other kinds of stem there's cells. There's many types of stem cells for many different categories. So our world is called hematopoietic stem cells, meaning stem cells that can make blood, and mm -hmm. that's it. That's all they can do. So there's you're no controversy. You're a pediatric hematologist right. oncologist. And this is used to replenish your blood system and your immune system, but that's it. They can't turn into a liver, they can't turn into a spinal cord or a heart muscle or anything else, and they certainly can't turn into a baby. So there's no controversy about that type of stem cells, but likewise, there's no fantastic potential, at least at the moment. So has, right. it, has, it, yeah, has the controversy about embryonic stem cells, uh, let's put it this way, collateral damage on these non-controversial areas? Yes, it's mixing up an acorn with a leaf. An acorn can grow into a huge tree and, and make leaves and branches and continue to do so and reproduce mm -hmm. itself and on and on and on, and a leaf is a leaf. That's what it can do, which is what hematopoietic stem cells can do. They can recreate blood cells, they can make white blood cells, they can mm -hmm. make red blood cells, they can make platelets, and that's it. Now, that's fantastic if you need a new blood system, but not to meet these other needs where other types of stem cells, especially embryonic stem cells, have fantastic potential, fantastic promise. Right, but in terms of the cord blood cells, right. uh, what category of stem cells does that fit into? Hematopoietic. So the, the cord blood cells, strictly speaking, are for the hematologic disorders yeah, and so only forth. Only speaking. Right. Yeah, there's no such thing as using... Um, uh, stem cells from your baby's placenta for 
grandfather's heart attack or right. someone's Alzheimer's disease. Yeah. So what is, I mean, you're kind of downplaying yeah. it, but then that being said, what's so special about umbilical cord uh, stem cells? Well, there's many things that make it so exciting. It, because it's in the news and it's controversy. Yeah. Uh, Tell us, you know, what, what's up well, for The that? reason stem cells from the placenta, umbilical stem cells, are so exciting and such a breakthrough in our world is two things. Number one is the availability. It's easy to get. There's no, there's no trauma or danger to the mother or the child. Uh, there's an infinite supply, essentially, because of babies being born mm -hmm. in the placenta. Um, they have the capacity to regenerate somebody's immune system and blood system uh, with amazing uh, ability, much more than a more mature person who donates bone marrow cells, for instance. Yes. Uh, it doesn't have to be a perfect match, which is another uh, great thing. So I may not be able to donate to you, adult to adult, because we may not be the same ethnic background. However, it's very possible that my umbilical cells could be used to... Or your uh, baby's umbilical or cells. Or could yeah. be used to treat your, you, even if we're very different uh, DNA level, very different uh, ethnic background, and that's an amazing uh, thing. Right. And then just yeah. to put this in context, essentially the umbilical, well not essentially, I guess in actuality, the umbilical cord blood cells are coming from the placenta. Yes. So that is obviously a product of conception, it's a product of birth, and it's normally just discarded. Right. And so there's no, we'll get into that, there are some practical difficulties, but in a sense there's no extra procedure being done, there's no harm right. uh, other than what we'll talk about, there's no... Risk. Extra procedure, no risk. Right, to baby or mother, and that's what makes it so uh, fantastic. And right. Easy to obtain. So, uh, what are some of the limitations, though, of core blood stem cells? I mean, uh, other than the limited in, uh, limita limitations and in indications, they last forever. Are there other limitations related to that? Well, one of the biggest limitations is weight. Uh, it's, it's based on the dose, the number of stem cells per kilogram. Okay. Yeah. So uh, we'll get into that. We're going to also talk about some of the controversies. It sounds like a chip shot, like something very easy, but it actually is a complicated topic. So Dr. Paul Ken, Paul, class of 86, pediatric hematologist, oncologist. Uh, doctor, what should I do about my baby's cord cells? Stay right there. Once they've outgrown their toddler seat, they're still not ready for adult safety belts alone. Four foot nine is the magic number. Until then, kids need a booster seat. Make sure your little pumpkin gets there safely. Visit BoosterSeat.gov. Protect yourself from mannequinism. Volunteer. Vote. Stay informed. It's easy to get involved. Uh, Paul is, uh, welcome back. Paul is uh, <laughs> exclaiming uh, delight at the uh, Harvard fight song. I know that many of you are not listening to this just for that music, but uh, this certainly brings back memories. You were in the Harvard band. Yes. Any uh, interesting anecdotes about that? Uh, well, I actually preface this that the drinking age was 18 back when we were in college. That's right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and anyone who remembers the Harvard band, those are two uh, not unrelated comments. So <laughs> but yes, I have many wonderful memories of the Harvard band in the so football games. So <laughs> given that they're not unrelated comments, does that does it make sense that you have memories of those? Yes, right. <laughs> Maybe not quite. The Harvard band uh, was a pl great place to have a party. Right. Um, <laughs> well, I was busy with crew and all that, so... But uh, actually, it's quite relevant. We had Walter Keats last week mm -hmm. talking about North Korea. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know if you had a chance to see that, but Walter is one of the few Americans that basically goes yes. to North Korea uh, frequently or relatively frequently. 
as opposed to never. <laughs> Most yeah. of us never going to North Korea. And he talked about how the country, North Korea, was incredibly indoctrinated. Mm -hmm. They have speakers in everybody's home that tells them what to do. Big what, brother. A big brother. Yeah. It's just incredible. And so we got into a little segue, a little tangent, about how the Harvard band is specifically instructed to traipse through Harvard Yard early on Saturday oh, morning. Yeah playing the Harvard fight song and almost we were joking indoctrination because seven in the morning or who knows when it was eight in the morning I guess uh, you were oh yeah we started early we started early and uh, I don't mean music well yeah, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I remember that and it's 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 just amazing when I hear that Harvard fight song it just somehow resonates uh, even though I was not a card-carrying band member as it were right which is um, a, a loss for you indeed yeah um, but anyway, back to the topic of hand. Uh, as you know, we're talking about core blood cells. Paul is a, a leading pediatric hematologist, oncologist, now at Rush, also has uh, privileges at UIC. And um, why might a family wish to save or, or donate their baby's umbilical core blood? Well, there's one, one overriding reason that makes sense, and that is that you already have a child with a disease that can be treated that's if baby. you have a child. If with, you already have one oh, child. Right, right. And this baby has the same parents, same mother, same father, so it's a full sibling, not a half sibling. And, and the first child has a disease that can be treated successfully with stem cells. Sickle cell anemia would be the perfect example of this. Uh, certain types of leukemia, certain types of um, metabolic uh, inborn errors. This is the situation where uh, absolutely you should save your baby's stem cells. In fact, it'll be done for free. That's how, what a good idea it is. Uh, there are many places it will save. So who's paying that? Uh, because the chances of utilizing it are so high, there are two banks established by the government and also through Oakland that will save it for free. Just uh, because all they need is three to five percent of those uh, cord blood units to be used and they'll recoup their, they can pay for itself through yes, right. the cost of a transplant, which the, is The follow-on. Yeah, someone procedures. does a transplant that's very expensive, half a million dollars, some of that money goes to the bank. As long as they're using three to five percent of their units, they'll pay, pay for themselves. So if you have a child, already have a child who has a hematologic condition, mm -hmm. it's almost a moral obligation to, to save that core blood from the subsequent child. Or how, well, I mean, that's I a little bit harsh. No, I wouldn't overstate it, because one of the things that is overstated is the idea that this is your one and only chance to harvest these fantastic stem cells, and they are fantastic. It's right. a breakthrough in my world. But that's not true. Those stem cells are still present in the baby that was born. And we've had this happen on several occasions, several, not, not once see. or twice. For whatever reason, uh, they couldn't get enough cells. The cells were contaminated with bacteria whatever the reason was. And what happens? A few weeks later, you were able to get the stem cells from the baby. It's a uh, basically painless procedure. And mm -hmm. the baby still donates the stem cells, still used for the other child. It isn't, a, it isn't a once in a lifetime opportunity. It's easier when the baby's born. It is easier, but it's not, this is your only chance, which is sometimes what you're told as if, you know, right. uh, you'll never get a chance to uh, use or get these cells again for your child. Right. So tell us a little bit about the history of umbilical stem cell usage. I mean, this is new, but, it's, mm -hmm. but in a way it's not that new. The uh, first, when was the first transplant? Uh, How many are happening? What's, what's the story there? The first transplant was in 1988 in France. Uh, since then, there's been uh, about between 5,000 and 6,000 transplants done. A year? Uh, no, total. Oh, oh okay. Ever. Uh, ever, and uh, worldwide. And most of those are... Uh, allogenic, meaning from one person to another person who is unrelated, unrelated. Mm -hmm. But there is a substantial number of uh, several hundred, maybe 500, that are between siblings. What's only been done once ever is autologous. That means that the cord blood is given back to the same individual, given back to the same child. That's only been done because uh, they got they came down with some condition later and just by serendipity or not serendipity, just the way it worked, they had had their core blood saved. Is that how that worked? Uh, no, actually. It, the, the two examples, one uh, was a retinoblastoma, mm -hmm. uh, where they knew the child had retinoblastoma, and it ran in the, uh, very likely to have it because it runs in the family, and they could do in utero testing. So they already had the plan up front to save it. So it was a situation where there I was see, a right, reason right. to save it. It wasn't 
happenstance. It wasn't good luck. The second one was a, um, a child with uh, leukemia. Uh, the leukemia came back. They had saved the child's uh, stem cells, the umbilical stem cells, and against the uh, advice of most experts, they gave those stem cells back to the child. Mm. Uh, and this was very controversial. It's only been done once, as I said. And the reason it was so controversial is we know that leukemia cells are present the day you're born. We know that in... So in a sense, yeah. you are curing them, but you might have been implanting them with the seeds, essentially, of the cancer again. We, ho we hope he's cured. Yeah. This is a child in Chicago. It was done uh, at a uh, Christ hospital. Mm -hmm. We hope the child is cured. But the reason it was so controversial is there were many uh, p other options in terms of a stem cell transplant. And we know that it's very likely that the cord blood is contaminated with leukemia cells. The reason we know this is every study has demonstrated this so far. So that raises another interesting <laughs> point. Let's, let's say you yeah. have uh, a, a child and, mm -hmm. and tragically they get leukemia and you, you had a cord cell. Mm -hmm. Do you then have to really discard that cord blood? Yes. In fact, that's what you're asked to do. The National Marrow Donor Program, if you're someone who has donated your cord blood, you are asked to call them and say, right. yeah, I've been diagnosed, get rid of it. Throw it away. Well, <laughs> we have another opportunity to listen to uh, Paul's favorite music. <laughs> I'm overstating it, of course. Oh. But this is I Harvard, I on Harvard, and uh, we'll be right back. Uh, stay right there. Two words for you. Pop quiz. Ready? Name any funny movie. A drama. Name a mystery. And one more thing. Name the movie your kids saw today in science class. Know what really matters. Know about your kid's school. And know about your kid. Find out 100 ways to know more, do more. There's something about you, baby. Something about you, baby. I can't get enough. There's something about you, baby. I got you looking at me. I'm gonna call you bluff. There's something about you. There's something about you. The smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. It takes a man to be a dad. soccer practice what if something happens will you come get me there's no reason not to have a plan in case of an emergency should we go to the neighbor's house and some extremely good reasons why you should can you tell me talk to your family about what you would do in case of an emergency Welcome back. I hope you're humming along. Paul certainly is. Uh, we're talking with Dr. Paul Kent, uh, class of 86, assistant professor of pediatric hematology and oncology at the Rush University Medical Center about umbilical stem cells, also known as cord blood uh, stem cells. And um, uh, we not only scratched the surface of this controversial topic, what I did want to clarify was two related issues uh, before we keep moving on. Uh, the limitations of stem cells in terms of, um, you know, their storage limitations and, and what's involved in that and so forth. And then just a clarification, that child that was treated for retinoblastoma, mm -hmm. retinoblastoma is not a hematologic cancer. How did it work out that they, that was uh, an indication? Right. So the, limit, the, the t main limitation is uh, weight. If you don't have enough stem cells 
per kilogram, then your immune system, your blood system, will not engraft. That's the word we use, meaning it will never recover. And that weight is about 40 kilograms. It's about 100 pounds. So if you weigh more than 100 pounds, you're not a candidate for umbilical stem cell uh, treatment. And yet, when you look at the list that you often see, these are often adult diseases. I see. Yeah. So that's a little bit problematic. Uh, the so few, 100, 100 pounds? 100 pounds. If you weigh more than 100 pounds, then it's, it's not going to be enough. And you can't uh, culture and propagate these stem cells to get a greater mass? Well, what you are now uh, talking about is uh, a Nobel Prize, is what you're talking about. This, well, let's get to work. If, yeah, let's get to work. Uh, <laughs> this is being tried everywhere, and it will be a Nobel Prize. If you can make stem cells reproduce uh, to an essentially infinite amount, as much as you want. Without differentiating and all that, just... Right. Yeah. The controversy is gone. The problem of matching people is gone. The problem of utilization and resources is gone. All those problems are gone, just like that, because you have, you know, uh, hardworking stem cells that are cranking out the products you need indefinitely, meet everybody's need, Nobel Prize. So well, We're definitely yeah. exploring uh, important issues <laughs> on this show. So, no, we haven't got there yet. Well, that would be great, though, wouldn't it? And certainly all these options uh, that are listed would suddenly uh, make a lot more sense. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then the retinoblastoma issue, that, that's interesting. I mean, how was that disease, which is not ostensibly a hematologic disease, treated with stem cells? Right. So the, one of the most important uh, points to distinguish is an autologous transplant, which means it's for yourself, uh, as opposed to allergenic, mm -hmm. I give it to you, or sibling, obviously giving it to a sibling. Yeah. Um, and the first one is what is by far the most common in the world of oncology, autologous. For instance, breast cancer. Same thing is true for retinoblastoma, for brain tumors, for a no number of different diseases where you've heard about transplants. And what this means is you take the person's stem cells, in this case uh, the baby, uh, they already have some type of cancer. It could be breast cancer, it could be retinoblastoma. So non-hematologic cancer. Non-hematologic cancers, exactly. Uh, in most cases, uh, that's what makes the most sense because you don't want those stem cells to be contaminated with cancer, right? Mm -hmm. Then you give very, very intense chemotherapy, a lot of times radiation, try to wipe out any last uh, uh, remains of the cancer. And you also wipe out the but bone But you also right? wipe out the bone marrow. You also wipe out the immune system. but. Lucky for you, you've saved essentially their immune system, their uh, blood system, uh, by harvesting before. It's in the refrigerator. Bring it back, infuse it back in, their same cells, uh, and it reconstitutes. It gives them their immune system back. So it's a way of basically removing their part of their immune system while you hit them very, very, very hard. Well, this is not a transplant at all. So the fact that you even use the word transplant is problematic. I mean, right. if I cut my finger off and go to the ER and they sew it back on, did I just have a finger transplant? No. <laughs> I mean, this is your own cells, yes, and they're right, being right. given back to you. Right. So what about in the pediatric world, though? In the pediatric world, if it was a solid tumor, that makes sense. But what we deal with so much are diseases of the immune system, diseases of the blood. I see. If your child has sickle cell anemia, do you want to give, uh, you know, take their stem cells and give it right back to them? Of course not. But obviously, you're going to just give them the sickle cell anemia right back. And the same is true for leukemia. Right. And the same is true for most every horrible disease you can think of. Uh, so is there a general <laughs> applicability to these solid tumors? I mean, the sense that uh, they tried uh, bone marrow transplant for breast cancer, for example. Mm -hmm. And that really hasn't panned out. But could core blood transplants from related, you know, your children, in a way, save your own life in that regard? No. And not, I mean, it's not, that doesn't change the dynamic uh, in most ways. There's one variation on that theme, but basically an autologous transplant. So my, uh, I have loved ones with breast cancer, and yeah, right. God forbid they, uh, someone needed a, a transplant, you would harvest those cells. And all that is is a mechanism for you to give very, very intense chemotherapy or radiation. That's all it is. There's no real transplanting going on. It's a mechanism to give doses of chemotherapy and radiation that normally you could never give because the immune system wouldn't tolerate it, the blood system wouldn't tolerate it. Immediately after you do this high-dose therapy, you give the, the stem cells back, they reconstitute the person. But as you see, it, that doesn't have anything to do with the breast cancer exactly. It just right. allows you to access a new tool. But I guess my right. question is, 
that that tool is that expanded by the whole core blood cell phenomena? Well, uh, you or, have to weigh less than 100 pounds, wouldn't oh, you? Oh, yes. I guess that's the problem. Right. We are, we, there are, have been reports of double transplants. It's been done about 20 times ever. So in other words, two cord bloods go to an adult. So that gets you up to maybe 200 pounds, right? So now, you, but then you have two different immune systems being infused into a third party, essentially. So, you know, uh, one of the problems <laughs> has been graft versus host disease. Now you have graft versus graft disease. Of sorts. Possibly. Yeah. Now, one of the wonderful things about uh, um, cord blood stem cells is this horrible disease, graft versus host, which is essentially when the immune systems are fighting each other, mm -hmm. is far, far less. That's exactly why we're so excited about it. That's exactly why using umbilical stem cells makes such good sense, is because graft versus host disease is far less. Right. Um, in terms of banking, Core blood cells. I know that there's uh, an industry developing around this. What are some of the controversies involved in banking? It should seem like it's not a big deal, mm -hmm. but apparently there are some issues. Well, there's a lot of issues. This is what we ha got when we had our baby, and it's what everybody gets more or less. It's many different you can show pamphlets. That, uh, yeah. And you can comment as I sh show it on the camera. Uh, what made actually Rush unique, it's one of the only places, because I have lectured at lots of different uh, OBGYNs or pediatricians office that actually has the national marrow donor program. It actually has a pamphlet in there where you can give your baby's core blood to the world. Yes, this one. Yeah, you could save someone else. Right. Uh, that's actually unique. Most of the time it doesn't have that. It has the private uh, banking That's like, for firms. example, this uh, one. That's also the one that's made out of cardboard is also the donation one. The ones that are in the really nice... Oh, <laughs> the, the glossy <laughs> ones. Glossy ones. <laughs> Which... Um, so this one, for example. Yes, and try to find... Bio sale. A, yeah. Those are the private banking uh, companies. And as you, I highlighted a couple things, it it says the chances of using these for your child are between 1 in 200 and 1 in 400. The estimates from the marrow transplant people, the American Academy of Pediatrics and so on, are about a thousand times less than that. Right. Well, let's uh, develop that. And uh, controversies involved in cord uh, uh, umbilical stem cell banking. Uh, I'm Ogan Garel. This is I Harvard, I on Harvard, with Dr. Paul Kent. Paul, a classmate of mine from '86. Stay right there. tell if you've had way too many but what if you've had just one too many buzz driving is drunk driving hey guys thanks for coming are we in trouble no you're not in trouble i just uh, want to set some ground rules like, like what well remember last week when you hit Vinny in the head with the shovel <laughs> i do not recall that <laughs> of course not well it was pretty graphic too graphic for the kids, <laughs> so I'm gonna have to block you. I, you know, I gotta make this up to you. This is Vinny's watch, and I want you to have it. You deserve no, it. Thank you. That's really not necessary. No, no. Come here. Welcome back. I'm Ogan Garel. I on Harvard, and we have Paul Kent, uh, Assistant Professor of Pediatric Hematology, Oncology at Rush. We're talking about cord blood cells, and uh, we've developed a lot of the uh, basic ideas and, and how it's used, where it's used, uh, how it's uh, taken, but we're now going a little bit into the business, the ethics, the, uh, the practical aspects of stem cord blood banking and it's a controversial area during the break uh, Paul and I were discussing that there's some legislation around it tell us more well uh, when your child is born you're vulnerable even my wife and I are both pediatricians uh, I think we bought another million dollars of life insurance in the first week because suddenly you feel this incredible responsibility and need to do 
anything for your child. And certainly, uh, I think the people who market to new families are completely aware of this. If you say this is a chance, even a small chance, that might help your child that possibly uh, could ask as an insurance policy, and those are the exact phrases you'll find in all of these, it's an insurance mm -hmm. policy, that's very, very uh, tempting. It's very hard. In fact, there's guilt involved almost if you, don't, if you won't take on this um, chance of a lifetime. And I think that's one of the problems is that it's quite uh, misleading. I think that's why so many national and international organizations have jumped in. Normally they don't get in the middle of business transactions and, yeah. or pharmaceutical companies or anything else. And yet uh, every major uh, institution you can think of, the National Institute of Health, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, the Canadian government, the European Union, uh, all have issued position papers saying this marketing directly to these vulnerable families needs to stop, or at least there has to be some truth in advertising, some regulation. So it's almost like uh, DTC, direct to consumer <laughs> advertising on steroids. <laughs> yeah, 90%. Because it's, it's during right. this uh, few days, even around. Weeks, it starts weeks before, because we got <laughs> sent all this stuff in the mail when we had our right. uh, children, and certainly in the pediatrician's office and others. Uh, the one place you don't see all this is in the um, offices of cancer doctors like me because we know that this doesn't make sense. So we're not the ones who are being... So tell me how it doesn't make... <laughs> how does it not make sense? What is really the problem with, other than just a hard sell and, and, and all that? What is, what is the crux of the matter that needs to be legislated? Right. Well, for one thing, 10,000 people die every year waiting for some type of stem cell or bone marrow transplant because they don't have a match because they don't have a match. 80% of them are minorities, especially mixed race, especially mixed race minorities. Uh, and clearly, if we were able to uh, donate even a tiny fraction, a tiny proportion, one out of a thousand uh, placental cord blood units, we could meet the needs of many, many, many people. I've had several mixed race and minority children who died because they, we could not find a match for them. So the problem with these private companies is they're taking that out of the general public availability. Correct. Because it's basically this 100 pound limitation. It's not like you can spawn off multiple copies of this stem cell yeah. uh, bank for your child and then a little bit is taken off for more public use. Just like if we, you know, God forbid, get involved in a car accident, you know, we sign that document, our heart and lungs, etc., can be used for others. Right. And so essentially the problem with these banking companies is it's really might be good for that family on a one in a million chance or one in a thousand, uh, we could talk about those statistics, but it really undercuts the whole public transplant uh, availability. That's one part of it, certainly. Uh, that's one part of it. But others, for instance, there's no regulation. There's no regulation that you test for infections. There's no regulation that you check for inborn errors or other types of serious diseases where, obviously, if you're donating your cord blood, it's checked for all of those things. And obviously, if you find any of those things, the family's notified. There's no research being done. Why would you? If you so why wouldn't some of these companies not notify? Why? Well, why, they're not even checking. Why would you check? If you checked and you found out that someone Then you'd have donated, to reimburse them and... Yeah, or what if, why, they don't even check to see if it's alive. Why would you? We know in the national banks about 80% uh, are viable I by 10 years, and about 20% die. And these are under the best circumstances, right? So in other words, in addition so, to uh, the controversies are, in addition to... Quality control. Yeah, bringing, bringing the uh, availability of these stem cells out of the public domain, if you will, mm -hmm. where they can almost always make a difference, as mm -hmm. opposed to a one in a thousand chance of making a difference. The other problem is quality control and there's no, uh, there's actually counter incentives towards that. Exactly. And research, of course. I mean, research on And the third is, is research, yeah, exactly. It would be, is so important. I do uh, research on stem cells. A full one third of um, babies born at Rush, the parents have consented, signed a uh, consent document to allow us to have one tube of the baby's placental blood for research to be used for any research purposes that we deem uh, 
ethical and important, which shows that it's the public is willing to let us do research and expand our knowledge in the yes. in the field of stem cells, right? Right. Uh, so if you it's take just a matter of asking, if you take that tube, though, <laughs> does that compromise their? It's done after any collections are done because some families have collected uh, cord blood for uh, banking purposes. It's only a few cc's. I see. So, so the banking by these private firms is not. Uh, significantly impacting the research aspect. Oh yes, it is. So explain that. Oh, I, no, if no. you can take that vial, and and not as far as I know, this is w Rush and the project that I'm heading is the only one in the country that's doing this. But there's this need now. We want to collect stem cells for the purposes of research. It's not, and and it's a long process. You have to sign consent and get it approved and make sure there's oversight and make sure that everything's done ethically and properly, where there is no consent process for privately collecting blood, putting it in a bag and giving it to a company. A company that could go out of business, that has gone out of business. There have been companies that have gone out of business. Well, clearly there's a need, <laughs> there's clearly a need for the stem cells. Oh, absolutely. A and there's, on a research, and clearly families, you know, people buy lottery tickets. People will, no pun intended, bank on, you know, very small odds. So what, what, what is the proposal of you know, the academic community, people like yourself, to, to handle that need? You can't just stamp out these companies. Well, for starters, the... Uh, why, don't we, why don't we develop that right after? Sure. So stay right there. Uh, Paul is going to talk about how we can address some of these controversies, sure. some other proposals. This is I, Harvard. I on Harvard. I'm Ogan Gurel. We have Dr. Paul Kent, class of 86, classmate of mine, talking about cord blood uh, stem cells. Stay right there, we'll see you shortly. the support you need to reduce your risk of cancer, diabetes, heart disease, and stroke. Eat right and get active. Impossible. It's never too early to start reading to your kids. Are you prepared for what awaits you? There are amazing possibilities when you open a child's mind to reading. Log on to the Library of Congress website and let the journey begin. I love this. <laughs> <laughs> Paul can't get over the uh, Harvard fight song. Um, actually, when we were developing this uh, program, uh, I just couldn't get that song out of my head, and I think you're going to start to resent it after a while. You'll be cursing me under your breath. Um, it is very infectious, if well, no pun intended, of sorts. But uh, back to our topic, cord blood cells. Um, Paul has mentioned about the controversy of this, and I think he has some interesting statistics to share with us. Uh, this is from that company, Cryocell. Do you want to tell us a little bit about what uh, you were just uh, mentioning? Right. There's several companies, of course. This particular one shows different uh, themselves and the competitors, uh, three out of probably at least ten such, so such companies. So that's a general report, not just specific to them? Well, no, they're showing their competition. Okay. And if you add up the number of units that have been collected, it's about 400,000. The need is uh, written in these handouts is one in 200 to one in 400, the chance that you'll need it, which would mean that uh, if you do the math, 1,900 to 1,000 to 2,000 units would have been used. Mm -hmm so far on average just from these three never mind the roughly one million units that have been collected so far mm -hmm. in, the, in the united states we our estimate but the reality is there's only been two that have ever been used one was, one was in canada in retinoblastoma but in, in america there's only been one and the one time was january of this year mm -hmm. uh... and the report was published and got a lot of attention because it was the first time it was ever used and yet they act like this was a common thing first report of autologous cord blood, in other words, using it for the same person. Using the person's own. First time. And it was big enough that it made a paper and got lots of attention. That's how rare 
that this is, and this was extremely controversial because they do talk about the fear that they were reinfusing the child's own leukemia cells. Yes, of course. So there was legitimate fear. Right. Yeah. So this mm -hmm. one in two hundred, though, to be fair, I mean, albeit it does sound like a guess of sorts, mm -hmm. but isn't that over time? And, and stem cell transplants haven't been around so long. Mm -hmm. In a sense, children get leukemia in their, you know, eight, nine years old, even their early teens, etc. So we haven't had time to to see those statistics bear out. I mean, that, does that, in other words... Uh, right, but we know the number of children every year who get leukemia, that hasn't changed. We know right. the number of children every year who need transplants. The number of children in the United States each year who get leukemia is about 3,000. That's it. So the I guess... The need transplant is about 50. Right, so I guess the way to put this in context is that the numbers... <laughs> Under age 21. So, I mean, that's, yeah, the, not a lot. The numbers for public access, like you said, mm -hmm. you have in your own personal practice seen mixed race children die because they couldn't find a match, couldn't find a match mm -hmm. and that's clearly more than one that did benefit from this that's uh, in this paper. So that, mm -hmm. it's a balance between those numbers that... Well, is, I hope this child benefited. Well, obviously, we yes. Hope. Yeah, we of all, God willing, the child did benefit. Um, but in a sense, like a lot... Of but as I said, this is, to me, this is no different than someone with sickle cell saying, I'm going to give my child's stem cells back, and they have sickle cell anemia. Well, what do you think is going to happen with that? Right. Sickle cell is going to come back, of course. So back to the question before the, <laughs> for, before the break. So what are ways ar uh, around this to address some of these needs? Yeah. Uh, what, are, what are some proposals out there, and what's this legislation? The, uh, there's legislation in the U.S. Congress, uh, Stem Cell Act of 2003, actually um, a senator from... Uh, Illinois is one of the, it was one of the original authors. That Barack Obama. Uh, no, it wasn't uh, Barack, it was the... But Durbin. Thank you. Yeah. Dur Durbin. Um, and the idea was to give funding for the establishment of uh, donated, altruistically donated cord blood uh, for the purposes of research, access, dissemination, and most importantly is all, all indications. How about new indications? How about other ways we can use this? And how about the Nobel Prize that you're going to win? Expanding stem cells so they can meet a larger need. You, right. c you don't have to stop when you're 40 kilos or 100 pounds. You could suddenly let adults be part of the recipients of this fantastic technology. Right. Right. And what is the status of that legislation? It was passed uh, one house and is stuck in the other. I think it passed the Senate and is stuck in the House, but it might be the other way around. <laughs> So the other aspect is uh, bone marrow stem cells can be donated not just from cord blood. I right. mean, are there, are there other mechanisms to do oh, that? Oh, sure. In fact, uh, I want everyone to sign up. If you're mixed race or a minority, then uh, you should pause this conversation and do it right now. It's 1-800-MARROW2, uh, the number two, or even easier, www.marrow.org. Couldn't so 1-800-MARROW-2? Two. 2, yep. So that's 1-800-MARROW-2, 1-800-M-A-R-R-O-W. Number 2. To number or two. even easier, www.marrow.org. Mm. Donating uh, stem cells is no different than donating blood or platelets. You watch a movie, uh, as long as it's not more than two hours, so you can see the end. Right. Uh, you sit there, they harvest your stem cells, you go back to work. There's been these... Uh, pamphlets make it sound like it's this horrible thing. Donate <laughs> stem cells. It's not at all. It's it's easy. So it's like a uh, <laughs> it's like a blood donation. Yeah, exactly. The, we have a machine that pulls out just the stem cells, and your own blood is returns back to you again. So uh, I want to address a, a little pr yeah. interesting practical aspect of uh, umbilical cord blood cells. When I was in medical school, uh, I had an experience during my obstetrics uh, rotation mm -hmm. where. Uh, I was observing a baby being born, and the gynecologist was presiding over that. And then the baby started to cry, and just emotionally you get connected to that. But what impressed me, or what I noticed, was the gynecologist handed over the baby, and the gynecologist was a woman, and it could be a man or a woman, but you, you would imagine motherly instincts, but she was totally focused on the mother, and well, professionally. <laughs> and so the pediatrician took over the baby, and it's like, then the the point is the placenta is falls in between. Who takes care of the placenta now that it's important? <laughs> or is your attention uh, diverted? Distracted, yeah. And that's a that's a potential issue. Yeah. If you're taking the time to collect it, it takes five or ten minutes. Uh, who's dealing with the mother? 
who's dealing with the baby. And hopefully these have been assigned. That's exactly why you need a consent process. How about this? How about if you drop it or contaminate it? Are you at fault? Can you be sued? Mm -hmm. Most of these uh, banks have a statement you need to sign that says you will not sue them if the stem cells die, if they for some reason thaw, if they for some reason are contaminated. So can the family sue you now? So who is the professional, though, whether you can sue or not that's responsible? Well, is it a gynecologist? Paid? or? So I've asked the gynecologist if they get paid, and they say, no, I don't want to be paid, because if, we get, if they get paid, that makes them an agent of the com company, Got and it. they are vulnerable. So it's a tricky business for them. They're poor. They get sued for enough, the poor guys. So <laughs> I'm Ogan Garel. We have Paul Kent, a uh, pediatric hematologist, oncologist, former track star. We didn't get into this. He was... Uh, uh, training for the national team or uh, the trials and so forth. This is I Harvard, I on Harvard. Great show. We'll see you next week. Thanks a lot. Thank you.